Hello and welcome to Wisdom and Productivity, the podcast of Dr. Efraim Martinez. I am a principal in search of wisdom, and I have found productivity to be a great tool for success. Today, I have the great and distinguished honor of interviewing Dr. Amy Heineke, who is a professor of multilingual teaching and learning in the School of Education at Loyola University, Chicago. Her research focuses on teacher education for culturally and linguistically diverse classrooms, which trends focus on pre-service and in-service teachers' preparation for emerging classroom bilingual and language policy work in practice to support students' learning and language development. I first met Amy when I was an assistant principal back in a gazillion years ago at Bateman Elementary, and it always struck me how professional she was, how this academician embedded herself so well with the school community, and I always appreciate that, and I'm very grateful that she's taking a moment to share her wisdom and productivity with us today. Dr. Amy Heineke, who are you? <laughs> well, first of all, Efrain, thank you so much for that introduction. It is so good to be here. Um, I loved our days, uh, Pulaski, Bateman. Oh my gosh, we do go way back. And it's so good to, uh, to be here this morning and chatting with you. So who am I? I am first and foremost, um, a mom. Um, but after that important role, I'm a teacher. Um, I'm from a family of teachers. My mom, my dad, my sister, my aunts, my cousins. Um, and that's really it's just such a huge piece of my identity. So now I teach teachers as a teacher educator, but I'm surrounded with, with, with goodness. I'm surrounded with my people uh, every day because of that. Um, I learn from teachers. I try to also facilitate learning of teachers at the same time. Um, but I'm really lucky to do what I love, um, to, to work alongside teachers, to do research and writing that supports teachers' work, um, and to do it all with a lens on our multilingual learners, who, who, as you know, is a population that needs more attention in our schools to be able to, to really improve their educational uh, opportunities and their experiences. Beautiful. So we can understand uh, uh, what you do. Can you walk us through your professional journey up to this point? Yeah, so um, my educational journey just turned 21, um, which as I think about, you know, kind of blows my mind because um, it all happened so quick. Um, I started teaching uh, in South Phoenix in Arizona uh, in 2002. So I uh, moved out there, you know, bilingual, ready to, ready to teach bilingual students. Um, and I worked at CJ Jorgensen School on the South Side. It was a predominantly Latinx community, um, about a 50-50 split of like established uh, families who have been there for generations as well as very recent immigrants, um, but a large percentage of multilingual learners. And as a beginning teacher, um, that was, a, a, you know, early on, just a very huge passion of mine, realizing the things that I needed to do to learn, to change in my practice, to, to bring out all of their rich cultural backgrounds, um, to scaffold and support their language, to partner with their parents. Um, and so while I was teaching, I got my master's and, uh, simultaneously at Arizona State, which is what helped me learn um, to do all of the things I just described. I didn't do it on my own by any means. Um, I, I loved it. Um, I loved the professional learning. I decided to continue on for my doctorate again while I was teaching. Um, and then ultimately it was in 2007, I shifted into a role of coaching teachers um, and kind of going into classrooms and observing and providing professional support. And then also teaching classes at the university at night. Uh, 2010, I got a job and had finished my PhD and I got a job here, here in Chicago at Loyola. Um, really uh, fortunate um, because I'm from here. I'm from Southern Wisconsin. My family's from the Chicagoland area. So it was just like the serendipitous, perfect experience. I've been at Loyola for the last 13 years. Um, as you said in the intro, working with teachers, both in service and pre-service, supporting schools. Uh, in their work around multilingual learners. And uh, I'm just, I, I'm incredibly fortunate to do work that, that I enjoy, but also that I feel makes a difference uh, in schools to really support teachers in doing their good work. Beautiful. I, I wonder, um, uh, do you remember the moment in, in time where you realize, hmm, this is what I want to do. I want to help teachers. I want to become a professor, a teacher of teachers. Do you, can you share us with that story? 
Yeah. So I will say that early on in my teaching career, um, so I moved to Arizona right after the passage of Prop 203, which basically um, eradicated bilingual education in the state. Um, and here I am, I'm bilingual, you know, elite bilingual. I chose to become bilingual. I moved to South America. I, I learned Spanish in, in school. Um, and I have all these students with this rich ability in front of me that we are taking like purposefully, just sta explicitly stating we want to take it away. We want you to only speak English. Um, and that really bothered me, it, it, like to the core of my being. And so I remember like first year of teaching being like, I want to do something to promote kids bilingualism in a way, how come we're not, how come the U.S. isn't like Europe? How, how come I had to go to Argentina to become bilingual, right? Like, I think that we should have language policies that promote bilingualism for everyone. So that was early. I remember like year one of teaching, having that reflection. As I, you know, the next couple of years of teaching were, were challenging. This was post No Child Left Behind. We were reading first school. Um, so we had this incredibly scripted literacy curriculum and it was just awful. Um, and I remember, feeling so belittled as an educator. Um, this is actually FIN where I really got into understanding by design because I learned it as a part of my master's program. I was able to use it to design math and science instruction, which at my, it was like a night and day difference in my classroom, the scripted literacy and what that prompted in students versus like the amazing inquiry based hands on learning of, of math and science. And it was that situation, like UBD situates the teacher as the expert. It says like you are an expert and you can design your own curriculum. And it was that kind of shift in how I was situated um, that made me want to do the same for teachers. Like, like that made me say like, I want to not be the you know instructional coach that comes in with the with the uh, literacy curriculum and gives me a running record to tell me well how many words i strayed from the script i want to be the person who says you are amazing let's find your strengths let's build from those let's facilitate you know the inner the the finding of of expertise across across buildings across districts etc awesome i can feel your passion thank you for sharing <laughs> this i appreciate it so uh, like in Back to the Future, mm -hmm. if you could go back in time to any of the positions you have held, mm -hmm. what is one thing uh, or two that the Amy of today will tell the Amy of back then? So here's what I, I would say. Um, I worked a lot. So, uh, you know, in, in, in undergrad and in grad school, I worked multiple jobs, you know, like it, life's expensive. Um, and when I was a teacher in Arizona, I think I was making like twenty seven or twenty eight thousand dollars a year. And when you're you know, I just bought a house and, you know, was trying to support myself. And um, so I also I bartended on the weekends. I, uh, I every now and then I would secret shop a restaurant for a friend who had a business, you know, anything to make some uh, extra money. And I remember that being like really overwhelming and frustrating because like I had colleagues at Arizona State who got to be full time grad students. They didn't have to work. Um, they got to, you know, have the mentorship and they got to co-publish with, you know, different professors and they got to do all of these things that I didn't get to do because I was a full-time teacher, because I was bartending, because I was secret shopping, because I, whatever. And I remember at the time just being, you know, just being not, not just frustrated. Like, gosh, I wish I could have these experiences, but I will say this. I've reflected so much over the years about what has made me like successful in my job. And it's because I know how to juggle multiple things. It's because I was able to, you know, work, you know, in this place and then turn and work in this place. And that's really the job that I do now. I mean, half the time I'm teaching a course, then I'm going and doing a PD, then I'm writing a book and like all of these different, you know, hats and, and plates in the air. Um, I will also say kind of as a side tangent to that, um, I reflect a lot about how much bartending has helped me in what I do. Um, like, of course, teaching has helped me a ton, but there's something about that when it comes to like facilitating partnerships and building rapport where it's like, you remember their kids' names, you remember, you touch base, you can engage in this level of small talk to be able to, you know, build that, that trust and that rapport. And so I, I, I would have never thought that, you know. 15, however many years ago it was where I just needed extra money. I never thought it would actually contribute to like my ability to do what I do, but it does. So I guess I would say like every experience that you have, whether it be overwhelming, whether it be frustrating, whether it seems completely unaligned, can 100, it's part of the bigger picture. It's part of your bigger story that can make you, you know, better at what you do.
I absolutely love that. Um, uh, at some point before I became a, a teacher, I worked in hospitals and um, uh, it served me so well, even though at the moment I was like, what the heck I'm doing here? And so I'm so uh, um, unhappy. Uh, but, you know, Steve Jobs says that all, life only makes sense when it we does. look back and connect the dots, right? Okay. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that. I appreciate it. So, uh, Amy, as you know, uh, reading books is a luxury uh, for both uh, the mind and the spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, if you could gift two books, one fiction and one nonfiction, uh, to a loved one, which mm -hmm. books would those be? Oh, this is such a tough question. Um, I'm an avid reader. I am a huge proponent of, so I teach an entire course on culturally relevant literature. I just wrote a book on inclusive text. Like this is like, I have just hordes of books um, that I love using with students, with, with everything. But I would say if I had to like pinpoint and really narrow it down, um, my daughter is, is about to turn six. So she's at like that perfect age. We read together all the time. We just in the last few months made that jump to chapter books. Um, I, I should have said, when you ask this question, I'm like, of course it's going to be a children's book. Like that, there's just like no way around it. Um, so lately we've been making, making the jump to chapter books and she's like an animal fanatic. And so we've been doing all the old oldies, but goodies like Charlotte's web, the mouse and the mm -hmm. motorcycle, Mr. Popper's penguins. And you know, all books that I read as a kid. So it's, it's fun to, uh, to, to read those alongside her. So I would say one of them, would be have to be Charlotte's Web, just because it was one of it was the first chapter book I read as a kid. It was just such an amazing experience to sit along her and to hear her the way she transacted and engaged in the questions that she asked. And it, to me, it's just one of those you know childhood classics that just uh, you know continues you know decades later to 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 give you all the feels. So that would be my question. Um, for my nonfiction, I would say. Um, you know, as cliche as the silly as this might sound, understanding by design. Like this, this book by Grant Wiggins and Jay McTighe changed me. It changed my career. It changed my approach to teaching. I remember reading it as a part of my master's in 2002 and just being like, this is why I became a teacher. Like, this is what we, the work that we need to do. Um, and I still go back to it, you know, 20 years later and, yeah. and the original, right? And I, re I read, you know, there's a chapter called Understanding Understanding, where it's just like, getting at like we are not just here as educators to like facilitate rote skills like we are here to really deepen and, and make kids critical you know facilitate their critical thinking get them to think outside the body in all of these things and so uh, you know that would to me would be one of those nonfiction books that just stands out as something mm -hmm. over the last couple decades that I continue to go back to I'm definitely going to go back and reread that chapter it's so, so, good. so good. now that you're saying understanding by design um, at some point, I stumbled up, up, up on this gem, right? Yeah. Where I picture uh, you getting together uh, with the author of UBD and saying, listen, uh, we can do a twix, uh, a twist to this one to address the needs of, of uh, linguistically diverse students. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us? the story of this uh, gem of a book. Absolutely. So so uh, ultimately, this book started 20 years ago when I learned UBD, and I was trying to use it in a classroom with predominantly multilingual learners. Um, and it was like, how can I take this amazing template that prompts deeper learning and you know really promotes you know deeper thinking, and et cetera, but do it with a lens on our, on our multilingual learners, scaffold for language, prioritize language development, all those things. So it kind of started at, you know, just, just doing it as a teacher. And then especially as I moved into teach, as teacher education, I, you know, this was something that teachers, we, we would learn UBD in class. They'd be like, okay, so what about my multilingual learners? And I personally had a huge problem of saving it till the last box, you know, the last box on a lesson plan yes. where it's like, I'm going to plan everything. And then I'm going to think about my multilingual learners last. It was like, we've got to shift that. We've got to think of them first and across every decision we make in a, in a curricular instructional design. So we got a grant from the Chicago Community Trust. We, my colleagues and I at Loyola, um, and we partnered with CPS. So we were, we were partnered with schools on the North and Northwest side with a large number of multilingual learners. And this became the work of like, let's think about what it looks like to merge UBD and language. And through that, it was through Network One on the Northwest side, where I did a lot of, had a lot of partnerships. Um, 
uh, we met, I met Jay McTie. We went to a workshop to like get here, learn from the best, right? Learn directly from the source. It was like this total celebrity moment for me. And I explained to him what we were doing. I said, here's what we've been working on. I, and and he was incredibly intrigued and we talked more about it. And ultimately, at the, you know, we started a, a dialogue, you know, we exchanged email addresses. And ultimately I was like, Jay, I think this is a book. Like, I think this is work that we need to distribute more broadly because it's doing really incredible things in Chicago and we could share it more broadly. And he was all about it. It's like, let's do it. So that's where it came from. And it's still kind of surreal um, given that, you know, he was so instrumental in my early career that now we we have a book together and we, you know, share Christmas cards and, uh, you know, things like that. Beautiful. Awesome. That's, that's, a, that's, a, 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 I'm sure like one of the peak moments uh, in your professional career. 100%. Okay. So um, talking about influences, who is or who are your biggest influences? So easiest question to answer, 100% my mom. Um, my mom is just this rock star. You know, my parents divorced when I was a kid, three, three daughters under 12, a full-time teacher. And she's just, you know, always been a rock star. She has been working in the school district of Beloit in Beloit, Wisconsin, my hometown, for the last 52 years, she she retired once and went back immediately, you know, just cannot stay away from schools. Um, for like the last 32 or 33 years, she's been at Even Start Family Literacy Center, which it specifically serves the immigrant families in our community. So basically, since I was 11, um, she's been at Even Start and I've watched her and I've learned from her. Um, not just as a teacher, um, but she's also the coordinator. So she, the, her advocacy work for immigrant families, um, you know, she is not just at Even Start. She is the voice. I mean, she, she, the amount of, she travels around the district. She goes to IEP meetings. She goes, she is, is really instrumental in both children and parents, um, kind of learning the system, learning how to advocate, making sure their kids have what they, what they deserve. Um. And so that's, you know, she's been my role model and so much related to education, related to being a mom. Um, she's also been, I mean, she's the biggest facilitator in everything that I do. She's the one who said, go, go study in Argentina. She's the one who said, I don't care how much it costs. Like you're going to Northwestern. We'll take out loans. We'll take out grants. Your dad and I will split what well, we have to. Like, we'll, we'll, you know, like she's, she's the one who's always said, like, it doesn't matter. You, you will do it if, if you want to do it. Um, you know, she's still, you know, she, it's wonderful. She only lives an hour away. So, um, I said, we get to see her a lot. Anytime I need her, she comes and helps with my daughter. Like, it's just, I, I could not imagine, um, a better mom, like just in everything, personal, professional, she's just the most wonderful human being. Um, and, and just so great, grateful to be able to have had her as a role model for me. So. Wow. Wow. That's a uh, very touching. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, so all of us at some point, uh, some of us more often than others, feel that we might not be good enough or smart enough or, or blank enough. And psychologists call this imposter syndrome. How do you address these moments where you might feel this? Absolutely. I've definitely felt uh, imposter syndrome, especially shortly after. So, I mean, my biggest source of imposter syndrome is the fact that I only taught for five years, right? Like that is, um, I when I shifted into the role of coaching and I shifted in shortly thereafter to the role of teacher educator, um, you know, I'm facilitating PD. I'm teaching coursework to teachers with a mountain more of experience than me. And what I've, I, there's two things that I've really kind of pinpointed when it comes to imposter syndrome. Number one, it's all about like how we situate ourselves and our expertise. Like, I don't deny it. I name it, you know, like and I specifically um, elevate the experience of others. Right. So it's not like I am the expert and I am here to teach you teachers. It's like you are the expert and I'm here to give you tools to, to be able to use and harness that expertise in your classroom. Right. And so to me, it's a lot about how we situate ourselves. Like I I will always elevate the expertise of the teachers in the room because that's that, that's what they bring. And fortunately, the way I approach work with like UBD, uh, multilingual learners, it, it's exactly that. You all already have the expertise. I'm just giving you the tools to harness it in a different way, right? So to me, that's big. It's, it's how we situate ourselves. And, um, you know, it's also second about the kind of different roles in education, right? So, um, 
I was a classroom teacher for five years and I was a coach and I was a teacher educator. All of those have contributed to my, you know, overall pool of knowledge, right? I also couldn't do what I do now as a classroom teacher, right? I wouldn't be able to, you know, write a book on UBD that, that, that really showcased the incredible work of CPS teachers and how they uh, work with multilingual learners if I wasn't able to go to their classroom, if I wasn't able to teach their coursework, if I wasn't able to whatever. So I see my role as a teacher educator as really kind of serving as that that intermediary between all the great work that's going on in individual classrooms and school, because I have that more macro level view to see it and to share it. Right. Yes. And so that's the second way I do it. It's like it's saying like I somebody needs to do this role. Right. Mm-hmm. Somebody to have the role where you can step back, see more broadly, and then share the good work that's going on so others can learn from it. And that's what my work is, like my research and writing, it's not saying, look how smart I am. It's saying, look at this incredible work that these schools are doing and let's all learn from it, right? And so if if you situate yourself like that, um, you're not a, you're not an imposter, right? Because you're specifically naming what you bring to the work and the role that you play. Beautiful, thank you so much. Um, uh, There you go, Uh, listeners and viewers of the show, the wisdom of Amy. Before we continue, let's take a brief uh, pause to praise the Teach Better community. This podcast is a proud member of the Teach Better Podcast Network. Better today, better tomorrow, and the podcast to get you there. Explore more podcasts at www.teachbetterpodcastnetwork.com. Now let's get back to the episode. Okay. So, Amy, as you know, uh, being successful in any profession includes being on top of our productivity. But this means different things for different people. What does it mean to you? How do you get organized to do all these things and being here and there? Uh, what is the what happens behind the scenes? How do you get all these things accomplished? Uh, organization is it. I am a I am a hyper organized individual. Um, I am a to-do list girl, Ephraim. I am a, I'm all about the to-do list. And I, I, I've i learned over the years that I have to have a balance of the to-do list that keeps me focused on what I have to do, but also that doesn't stress me out at the same time, right? Mm. It's finding that balance. So well, here's what I do. I have a to-do list on my phone, you know, good old Apple, it transfers to the computers, whatever, whatever, I'm, whatever device I'm on. But that's where I do daily tasks. So like things I want to get done that day. And it only is, is are those short term things that I can get done because I want to check them off. <laughs> and if things sit on there for too long, it stresses me out. So I've learned that I can only use the to do list on my phone for daily tasks. Then for the long term tasks, I have to do bins. So on my wall here in my office, I've got a bin that says this week, this month, this semester. And that's where I, I kind of have my, my big picture like, all right, I have got a plan for my course that starts in the fall that can go in this semester. I have, you know, uh, article revisions to get done by the end of this month. That goes in this month. So, I, you know, I print off like, you know, a sheet, a paper or two. I put it on a clipboard and that's in my in my bins. So, again, it's not on my phone. It doesn't stress me out. It's not that like tangible thing, but it's on my radar. And that way, when I you know sit down to do work each day, I'm like, all right, this has to be done this week. Let's work on this today. And then, you know, if I get ahead, I can be like, you know what? I There is no need for me to finalize the syllabus for August, but I might as well because when the semester starts and I'm overwhelmed then, it's already done, right? So yes. that's kind of my my approach. The to-do list for short term, the to-do bins for, for long term. I like that. Clarifying question. Uh, uh, you mean uh, uh, Apple Notes? It's the Apple t- uh, checklist. Um, checklist. Yeah. Okay. And I just love it. I love, you know, the, the interface of Apple and how like... A, I'm on my daughter's iPad. There's my list. I'm on my laptop. There's my list. Right. I don't yes. have to. Yeah. Beautiful. So uh, micro tasks, you put it there long term. You have bins in your office yep. that tell you when you have to do stuff. Very good. Mm-hmm. Tell us about your uh, trajectory with a calendar. What app do you use or yep. you use a visual uh, manual calendar? How does yep. that look like? I use, I use Google Calendar. Um, and I have it color coded. So I've got, um, I've learned I have to have everything in there, like personal and professional, especially as my daughter gets more involved in activities, right? You know, that, that adds a whole nother layer of, uh, uh, of balancing. So I've got, you know, work is gray and and non-work is, is pink and my daughter is green or something like that. Right. So it's all there. So I can see, you know, I have all this to do to work, but let's not forget, you know, gymnastics or let's not forget whatever. 
Um, so yes, definitely Google Calendar. Again, nice because it's on my phone. It's on my computer. It's on, right? Um, I was a paper calendar girl for years, but I, I love the, I love, you know, having it tangible wherever I am. Beautiful. Um, I also am a big fan when it comes to a calendar of clumping. I call it my calendar clumping. Um, I, I have, like I said, a lot of different roles, right? And so um, one of the big pieces of my job, I mean, like 40% of what I, I do at Loyola is research and writing. Um, but if you don't block off time on your calendar for that, other things will will take over, right? And it's just like, I know some academics who are like, oh, I write on the weekends or I write in the summer. I'm like, ah, no, if it's 40% of my job, I'm writing during the work week. Um, and so I'll protect my calendar time. So I'll like specifically say, um, I'm not scheduling meetings on a Wednesday because that's my writing day. And that allows me to, to you know, really carve out and protect the time that, that I, I want to, you know, put towards it. Um, so, yeah. Beautiful. And uh, tell us about uh, what happens when it's writing day. Is there like a, a, a ritual that you do or you just get sit down and start doing it? Uh, mm -hmm. What should we know? All right. So I am a big proponent of writing often. So again, like I said, some people write in the summer, some people write on the weekends. When I'm in the midst of a project, project I try to write every day, um, at least Monday through Friday. Right. I'm, I've gotten much better at protecting my weekends for family. Um, but here's what I do. I am. It's all about the outline with writing. Like I it, it, am never looking at a blank page. I never um, don't know where I'm headed. Right. I always know where I'm headed. So um, I'll start, like say I'm writing a, a, a book. I start with an outline of chapters or say I'm writing an article. I'll have the sections of the article with a rough outline. And then that outline just keeps getting more detailed, right? I'll, it'll go from a rough sketch macro level to now I've sketched out a section and then I sketch out a paragraph to the point that when it comes down to like writing a paragraph, the bullets are already there because I flesh it out so much that I can just re reorganize it into a paragraph form. So that also helps me to get to your question of of kind of the, the what happens when you sit down for writing day. So if I I'm happy if I write two paragraphs a day because I'm writing just a little bit each day and I I know because I have my outline I can sit down and I'm like I can write the first two paragraphs of the intro today and the second two paragraphs tomorrow and guess what in two days the intro is done. So it it, it really helps me as far as um, going from you know blank page to full product, but also it helps me say like all right. I know that the introduction is going to be five paragraphs because I have my outline right here. I can do two today and three tomorrow and it'll be done. So, And like this might sound basic, but what is the advice on developing a, a strong outline that allows you to do exactly that? I mean, the outline to me, um, it, it's key, it, you know, I, I do everything with like a backward design lens, right? I know where I'm going, so it helps me get there. Um, and to me, that's that's what's key with writing an outline is, you know, your ultimate goal, right? You know, your audience, you know, the the points you're trying to portray. Um, you know, I often write like books, for example, with essential questions like UBD, like that's what the chapters start with. And so, you know, that as it, it helps to me, it helps the outline is all about helping you keep, stay focused, right? It's easy when, to me when you just kind of write like what's on your mind to kind of go off on tangents, but the outline can really serve um, to, to really keep that, that focused lens and make sure that you're coming back to those key points. So. Beautiful. And, and when you are quoting, uh, do you have books around your desk? Uh, do you use a software to keep your bibliography? How does that look like? Yeah, I've got books. I'm still old school like that. I might I've updated a lot, but I need I need tangible. So yeah, I have I have whatever stacks of books. Like if I know I'm going to be using X Y Z books in in the chapter, I've got them stacked up next to me. Um, many times I'll have them in piles by like okay, I'll use these in chapter two. I'll use these in chapter three. Um, I often like even articles I'll print off just to have the hard copy because I like to go through and highlight and make notes and things like that. Beautiful. And if you if you will have to do your PhD again and write that dissertation, uh, what advice would you give to yourself? Or in other words, what advice would you give for those that are in the trenches right now that are thinking, OK, I have to write a dissertation. Where do I start? What advice do you have? So I always recommend uh, for my dissertation uh, students, there's a wonderful book called The Dissertation Journey. I used it when I was a dissertator. 
Um, I it's multiple editions uh, since then, um, but it's it just it's so nice to focus. It basically it tells you what goes in each chapter, which is huge. Think when you think outline, right? When you think like, right. all right, I've got chapter one introduction, I've got chapter two framework and lit review. Um, it tells you like exactly what goes in each, um, like section by section. So there's the start of your outline, right? And you can just kind of plug in, and it's a really helpful way to be go from being like overwhelmed, I don't know where to start, to just saying, guess what? Pick a chapter, start an outline using this dissertation journey text, and then just start plugging in over time. Like that's, um, it, I also, another piece of advice I like to give is again, write a little bit every day. Don't think that, don't wait till all at once. Cause it, again, there's something like a paragraph a day is a book a year, right? Something like that. Uh, uh, where it's just like, if you write just a little bit, this doesn't have to be some overwhelming thing where you take off of work and you change your life and you go off to a cabin in the wilderness away from your family, right? If you can just carve out an hour a day, right? Get up a little early, stay up a little late, whatever you know meshes with your schedule, you can get just a little tiny bit done each day to work towards it over time. I love it. That's such a great advice. Thank you so much. Uh, tell us, um, outside of academia uh, and your work with teachers and, of course, your parenting, what does Amy do for fun? <laughs> um, let's see. Um, I, I love spending time, again, my family, first and foremost, um, my daughter's five, going on six, such a fun age, you know, so we do... We, I mean, yesterday we were just at the Brookfield Zoo. We spend a lot of time, zoos, aquariums, museums, you know, for, so fortunate to live near Chicago. Um, we're members everywhere, you know, so we spend a lot of time at the field and the shed and the and Brookfield and things like that. So that's, you know, her fun is my fun. Um, we have a lot of fun doing that. Um, I have a dog. I'm, I'm a dog person. Um, my, my big boy is almost 12, but he still loves his walks. So we go on a couple walks a day. That's kind of like my exercise, my break it makes him so happy. So it makes me happy. Um, you know, again, I'm fortunate to have family nearby. Um, I, uh, live, you know, about a block away from my cousin. So I love spending time with her, um, hour away from my mom and, and my dad, my sister and her kids. So yeah, that's, that, that's really what, what, Fun for Amy looks like at 43. <laughs> nice, nice. Uh, what kind of dog? A lab mix. Um, okay. He was rescued, so we're not sure exactly what, but um, lab and, and and something. Beautiful. Thank yeah. you so much for uh, sharing uh, uh, your productivity. Uh, any last words for the listeners and viewers of the show? Um. I, you know, I, I think I just where I'm at right now, I, I feel like I need to share um, my cousin uh, or my, I'm sorry, my nephew, uh, my four-year-old nephew, Axel, is fighting cancer right now. So um, he's been in chemo for about 12 weeks. Um, he's about to shift into daily radiation. And I know we're all about gratitude on this show. And I, I just feel like the need to express gratitude outside of work. Um, you know, we often don't realize the support system that we have. Um, in normal times, right? When we're just kind of going through the day to day. But when something uh, crazy happens, you know, something that just disrupts life in such a way, the way that people come together. So the last 12 weeks have been, you know, obviously incredibly tumultuous in our family, but the level of gratitude that I have for people um, from across our lives, like across my life, my sister's lives, uh, my mom's and dad's life, I mean, just like thousands of people. We call ourselves Axel's Army. My nephew's name is Axel. And, um, you know, grateful for, for my job, which is flexible, which has allowed me to go out to Arizona to help. Grateful for my sister's job. She works at United Healthcare, and they have just been incredible to her, right? And so I, I feel like, again, since it's always at the forefront of my mind right now, like sharing that with listeners about recognizing the networks that you have that you don't even realize are there. And also being grateful for, for any sense of normalcy that you have in your life, because in one day that can change drastically and recognizing that we have those networks behind us to support us can, it, it is just incredible. Wow. Uh, I much appreciate uh, that. I'm sending the most positive advice for Thank your you. nephew. Thank uh, you. And let's all be grateful for uh, the networks of support that we have. Absolutely. Amy, thank you so much. Have a fantastic Sunday. Thank you, Efrain. Thank you for listening to Wisdom and Productivity, the podcast of Dr. Efrain Martinez.
Chulu. And Anna, that production. Chulu out.